Welcome to the Stan State Educast, a podcast created to give members of the Warrior community a place to share their expertise on various topics and issues. I'm your host, Frankie Tovar, and on this episode, we have returning guests, a trio of political science professors, to have a discussion we're dubbing the Midterm Postmortem. We're more than a week out from election day and there are still several races to be called. And so there's definitely gonna be a lot to talk about today. So without further ado, our guests for this episode, Mr. Richard Randall, Dr. Stephen Ruth, and Dr. Andrew Conte. You're listening to the Stan State Educast, produced on the campus of Stanislaus State. I think we'll dive right in, a lot to get into. The first question I have, did the midterms play out the way you all expected? No, not at all. Uh, if you look at the historical average, uh, the president's party loses about 34 seats. Um, there have been some horrific catastrophes for, for presidents, even really popular presidents. Uh, Ronald Reagan took a huge hit, uh, Bill Clinton, and the latest, of course, was Barack Obama, who took a, a, a really big dive. So even you know presidents who get reelected who are very popular kind of uh, fall into this trap. And uh, traditionally, at least the political scientists, uh, you know, that I've read tend to look at the midterm elections as a referendum on the president. Uh, Since the president is not on the ballot, the closest they can get is a referendum on his party. And in this case, I think there were multiple referendum. Uh, I think there was, uh, for some voters, a referendum on the economy. Inflation was the number one issue. But the number two issue in the election was abortion. And I think this really shocked uh, a lot of Republican pundits. And uh, if you look in a lot of races, the uh, election deniers, uh, the the Trump-backed candidates just took an absolute bloodbath. Uh, And so there was a a post-mortem. In this case, uh, the, the, the person who died was, was the Trump acolytes. And I think the one that surprised me the most personally was, was Carrie Lake. I mean, uh, in Arizona, uh, Lake seemed to have a lot of things going for her. Uh, she was well known. She had been on the news for many, many years in the Phoenix area. Uh, she had uh, some charisma. Uh, she was very, very articulate, uh, unlike some other Trump candidates. And uh, and she was an attractive candidate, and we know that that helps. It, it helped John Kennedy many years ago, and I thought it was going to help her. And, and uh, the fact that uh, she did some very dumb things late uh, in the campaign, like alienating uh, the McCain Republicans in, in Arizona, I think, contributed to her death knell. But for me, the election was a shock. Uh, my prediction in class was the Republicans would pick up 22 seats in the House and that they would pick up three seats in the Senate. So uh, don't go betting uh, based on my uh, gambling advice on these things because uh, I got fooled. And Steve and Andrew may have been more adept uh, than I was leading into this. I'm on the same page as Rich. The My, my predictions were very close to his. This is a, clearly a rebuke of the Republican Party in, in this cycle, which is which is surprising. You look at the uh, rate of inflation, you look at, uh, at Joe Biden's uh, approval ratings, and they correlate with one another to some extent. But, I mean, you look at uh, the, the past midterm elections, you crunch those numbers, they have the predictions are at least 15 to 20 to 25, max 30. I mean, clearly one thing that did help the Democrats here they weren't as defending as many seats as if they had 280 seats to defend. So that, that helped them. But that, that structural variable is there. Midterm elections uh, is a referendum on, on the president. There are several different theories that discuss why that is. I'm not going to bore you with that now. But the point is that this is, this is a serious surprise. And I think Rich nailed it on the head. I think it's a, it's a rebuke of, of Trumpism to some extent because you, you look at— all, one, thing I, one thing I would say as well, election analysts— have commented on the unprecedented quality of this particular midterm and because it kind of reflected presidential election dynamics. What I mean by that is that you looked at the at the generic ballot. The generic ballot is a national survey of registered voters and likely voters. And they're asked, you know, who, who are you going to vote for, Republican or Democrat, in the, in the election in November? You look at spring, to Republicans looking like they were going to do really well. You go into summer, looking pretty good. Then you get the Dobbs decision, Rose overturned, it flips. 
you start seeing Democrats being a couple points ahead on that. I mean, so I said that the Republicans were several points ahead of the Democrats in that generic ballot. That flips a little bit with Dobbs. Democrats were really empowered. They were a little enthusiastic to push back in the midterm elections coming up due to that decision they don't like. Um, then a couple of weeks out from the election, Republicans start, start surpassing them again. The trajectory of polling, the generic ballot is very clear. You typically see one party, you know, generally, you know, maintaining its, 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 its leverage, its, its, its position. And you just didn't see that here. And so concurring with Rich again, this, this idea that this rebuke, this rebuff of, 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 of Trumpism is like the, this, the key takeaway story here, because I said, if you didn't have Trump there, you just had a normal midterm cycle. Republicans pick up, pick up these seats. They pick up 20 to 25 just by the nature of, 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 of like the midterm curse for the president's party and, and, the, and those other measures I, I already discussed. But I mean, Trumpism and January 6th and the narrative Democrats effectively put forth under Biden's, under Biden's leadership and a speech about democracy is in peril. It definitely played into hurting the Republicans here. There, no, nothing else would really, would really explain it. Except for as well, as Rich alluded to properly, the idea of, of quality candidates. I mean, they clearly, they, the Republicans went over their skis a bit. They picked some less than stellar candidates. If they picked mainstream establishment Republicans with years experience who had held elective office before, they, they, they would have taken over the Senate. They made some bad choices and it hurt them in the cycle. I do agree with my colleagues on what they have said. but. I would like to add a few things more here. Number one, I think most Americans have shown that it should not be taken for granted. We usually think about the American electorate as not being so informed or careful about things. But this time, they were rather careful in the sense that they do not want a repeat of 2020 in 2024. They were voting with 2024 in mind. If Republicans had gained seats, more seats in the House and Senate, that would have been rather worrisome for the future of the United States. What happened following? the 2020 elections, there are many that do disapprove of that. It's not done in a lead democratic country. And that's why many things that happened came as a surprise to the media, to political scientists, etc. So as it stands now, the Democrats have lost the House, the Senate still up in the air, no, the, the Democrats have control of the Senate. The question is, will it be 50 to 50 with Kamala Harris breaking the tie, or will it be 51 to 49? And the Democrats hope it's 51 to 49, so they'll control all the committee chairs and won't have to share those out. So exactly. uh, it, it, it is important, um, the election. I mean, I'm not a Republican, but if I were and I wanted to put uh, some kind of uh, smiley face on, on the funeral, uh, if you will, I mean, I, I'd say a couple things. Uh, the the Republican that to me and my colleagues may or agree or disagree, but I mean, um, and the the Republican star that that emerged was was DeSantis. I mean, he he won a, a huge victory against one of those veteran, established uh, people who had been in office for many many years uh, in Florida and by twenty points. So so certainly. Um, and, and now he's already sniping with Trump and they're going back and forth. And that could be a, a battle within the party. It could be a huge fight in the family. And I think, you know, the only other thing the Republicans can hang their hat on is that we did take uh, the House, if, even if it's by a, a minor margin. But I mean, the Democratic response is they picked up governorships. Uh, they picked up state legislatures. At worst, they're going to be even and they're probably going to be up one. Uh, in, in the Senate and in a midterm election, as Steve pointed out, that's really unheard of. So I think it's a, a very good night for the Democrats. Uh, if you're a Republican, there are a couple things you can take solace in. Maybe you have a new leader instead of Trump, which I think if I were if I were a Republican, again, I'm not. Um, 
uh, not having Trump as my leader would probably be a good thing. And and having control of the House does give you some leverage and bargaining uh, with both the president and the Senate. So, you know, there are a couple fig leaves there, but there's no question this was a, a good election for the Democrats. I, I agree with that, but I have to say it's it's a it's a really good election for Republicans. They're taking over the House. They're, they can utilize the House as a springboard for a number of investigations into the Biden administration, Hunter Biden, his laptop, you know, Ukraine and China relationship, et cetera, et cetera. Also, uh, you know, they, they can, you know, that, that gives them a sort of gives them a platform to to really start preparing for the for the next electoral cycle. And so to, to tie up the Democrats and tie up Biden and they can stop and it tracks to a great degree the Biden agenda. Biden has will have, you know, the unilateral authority, executive orders. But, you know, Trump pretty effective about getting a lot of conservative judges in, into the federal judiciary. And they're going to review those for constitutionality. And typically, as you see it with the latest episode concerning the student loan executive order by, by Trump, you know, that's been stopped by the federal courts at this point. It's still working through it's through the system. But I think you're going to see more and more of that. And so I think, yeah, it, it, it was a really good night for Democrats, for sure. That, that rebuke of Trump and not losing a ton of seats. But so it's a really good night for Republicans taking over the House. It just is. Now, the, the Senate, Senate's going to be it's a disappointment. Um, that helps out the Biden administration dramatically in terms of appointments and confirmations, and they can hold committee hearings as well. But whoever the new incoming speaker is going to be to take over um, the Republican majority in the House, it's going to be a challenge. Any congressional scholar will tell you uh, that that's going to be a tough herd of cats to corral. And so it's going to be, from a poli sci perspective, it's going to be utterly enjoyable to watch watch the, <laughs> the, the challenges to leaders to wrestle with all that. And the same thing is going to be great to watch with Biden wrestling with divided government. So we'll see what happens with that. The elections were very competitive, professionally done. However, I think we should not forget about highlighting certain issues, my opinion, such as election security or elections and money or redistricting how it has affected the democratic process and how it will continue to affect this democratic process. And maybe we can also talk about election security. Yeah, last episode you mentioned there were going to be outside observers for this election. Yes. How did that all play out? Well. I just received a copy of their preliminary conclusions, and I would like to encourage our students, our faculty, etc., to look at the preliminary conclusions and maybe decide on what we can do with it. But as far as I know, they have highlighted in that report certain issues that despite the fact that this was a competitive, professionally managed report, it was however conducted in an atmosphere that undermined voters' trust for the election process or the electoral process. These are issues that we ought not to treat lightly. Particularly, they are coming not from enemy states. They are from friendly nation states. You got to listen to your friends. Well, Andrew, that money thing really uh, hit home for me and I ran across the price tag of that Pennsylvania Senate election, $375 million Whoa. Uh, yes, sir. spent in a Senate race. In my comparative course, I talk about Great Britain, and you have 2,500 candidates spend about $20 million, and you had two campaigns spend $375 million. And they're estimating that with the prelim election and the runoff in Georgia, it's going to dwarf that. So the role of money has become all-consuming. I mean, it's, it's been important for a long time, obviously, in America. It's not brand new, but, but the level uh, and the amount of money being spent is, uh, is incredible. 
A, a quick question I want to pose to my two colleagues here. Obviously, some we're seeing here are arguing that Trump is a weight on the Republican Party. Should he completely avoid Georgia? I mean, conclude the idea like Biden, low approval ratings. He'd only went to a couple of states. Jill did a lot of the campaigning for him because Joe was a little radioactive with the, the 40 percent approval ratings. Is that the same type of dynamic with Donald Trump? Should he avoid Georgia or should he get involved there? From a policy side perspective, things would be so much easier for us to explain and understand if 100 percent of the electorate turned out to vote in every election. But we know they don't. Only max, you know, 55 to 60 percent presidential elections. 40 to 45 percent typically in midterm elections. I can't wait to see the, the turnout this, this cycle. But the question that arises then is like turnout. Will, will Trump definitely weigh down in some of these states, you know, weigh down the Republican turnout? But like, would he help Georgia? Would he help out Herschel Walker and Andrew Warnock? What do you guys think? Well, I think if I'm, if I'm Herschel Walker, I'm, I'm begging Kemp, just won the election for governor. And I would really be trying to get him out on the trail for me. I wouldn't want Trump there, but it's hard to say no, especially when probably the reason you were nominated was because of him. In some cases, I mean, I think Walker's going to feel beholden to him. And I think if Trump wants to run there, I, I think he's going to feel he has to have him run. But, you know, as an outsider looking in, um, I don't think Trump can do a whole lot of good, and I think he could do some harm. So my perspective is is that Trump probably won't be able to resist. He'll, he'll want to show up and be the center of attention in front of a big crowd, and he'll draw a large crowd. He always does. Mm -hmm. but, but I think it's a net negative. That's, that's my feeling. Andrew, what do you think? Well, I'm sure he will go, and he's going to go. But maybe let him go. Do you think it, it helps or hurts Walker? It will hurt Walker, but that's not what Donald Trump is about. It's an opportunity for him to start his own campaign. It's all about him, not about the candidate. Yeah, you know, I, I just added that as well about one of the theories to try to explain why there's President's party always loses seats in the midterm. Rich hit one of them. It's a referendum um, theory. Another theory that also, the, the, these theories kind of flow into each other a little bit, but the, the other theory I want to talk about here is the question, the, the concept of negative affect. Negative affect, just social scientific term, affect feelings, emotions. And studies are clear that if you really hate someone, you really hate a candidate versus someone who loves that candidate, the equal amount just on the other side, you love them and hate them, the hater will be much more prone to turn out to vote on election day. And so that's the one thing I think that, that how Trump altered the dynamics in this cycle is that January 6th, in a very unusual, unique way of, of, of governing his president, the January 6th is pretty damaging to his reputation, to a lot of people, it's fearful. The election denial aspect of it, the, you know, the provoking of violence, you know, speech after, after the, the January 6th riot or, or, or attack on Capitol Hill, you're very special. I love you all. That just feeds into fears of, of, of independence and a number of Republicans and, and if not all blue voters. So I think that I think that's one thing I think that they, to think about the, these dynamics is to appreciate the negative feelings that he necessarily uh, brings about in people. He's a very polarizing figure. And Joe Biden's not that polarizing at all. Right. He tries to paint him like he's Joseph Stalin. He's not Joe Biden. But that just doesn't really that doesn't really get any traction. But Trump's record is, is problematic for a lot of people. And so if he goes to Georgia, I think guarantee he, he, he hurts Walker because of the negative effect, the negative feelings. He necessarily invokes for many, many people, including many Republicans, as I said. Georgia is usually considered a Republican state. The last couple of elections, though, it seems that it's been hotly contested. Why do you think there's a change down in Georgia? A big part of that is what they, they call the, uh, the uh, New South. Atlanta, the, the, growing, the growing metropolis there, has just got a, a, a more industrialized economy, leaving behind the agrarian economy to some extent. It's just it's just changing. It's 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 it's, it's socioeconomic uh, characteristics are, are changing dramatically over the years. So I think it's it's turning. Yeah, I wouldn't dare call it 
purple, but it's it's trending that way a, a little bit here. And it's remarkable, you know, uh, Warnock and Ossoff won one of those two seats, and and but I think I honestly think Donald Trump's fingerprints are over their victories as well. I mean, his his behavior. I mean, obviously January sixth occurred after their election on, on January fifth, but his election denial from from election day on up to that point. I think again that that he brings about such negative effect of voters opposed to him. They're more more motivated to turn out to vote than pe- people who love him. I wouldn't say it's ironclad law, but it's it's a it's a strong correlation between negative feelings versus positive feelings in your in your willingness to turn out to vote on election day. So yeah, I think you're right because if you look at at Georgia and you dig down deeper, you have a Republican governor and you have a Republican state legislature. So you're right. I don't think it's purple, but but it's competitive. Yeah. And and that's what I would say. For years, it it, it wasn't particularly competitive, and and, and it is again. I, I think Republicans still have the advantage in a normal uh, atmosphere, but it's changing. So I I concur with with Steve on that. Well, Americans don't vote about for on foreign policy matters. Americans vote basically on domestic issues. However, I would like to look at the foreign policy implications of this election. And indeed, I would like to say that if Republicans had taken Senate, then the foreign policies of the Biden administration in particular, its policies towards Ukraine would have been in jeopardy. But as it stands, the policy towards Ukraine will remain unaffected. There would have also been some changes in relation to U.S. foreign policies towards China and Taiwan, in particular Taiwan. These will remain unchanged. Meanwhile, on the foreign policy level, the United States of America is pushing hard on the China question. Will it continue like this or not remains to be determined. President Biden met yesterday with the Chinese president. I have not read the communique or the final statements that both made. But the fact that they met is a positive sign in itself. Who would have thought that Herschel Walker would have so much influence on not just domestic politics, but foreign politics? What are some things you can see happening if Walker wins the runoff? Well, again, as Rich said earlier, that uh, Democrats will still control the Senate by virtue of Kamala Harris's breaking the tie. When, as Andrew's kind of alluding to here, I think there's definitely a sense that Republicans are not nearly as energized and motivated as Democrats are to give money to Ukraine in its war against Russia. And I think so then basically, you know, sharing of, 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 of committee chair power inside the Senate may give a little more leverage, maybe give a little more leverage to Republicans in that, that instance, though. Nonetheless, Biden remains the president. Um, he's very much committed to Ukraine. Um, you look at the polling that our country is generally behind that. And so, you know, presidents really dictate foreign policy to a great extent. Republicans can try to push back against that via the House, a little bit in the Senate as well. Um, you know, it's interesting. I was reading an article the other day and it hit me. And I haven't seen anyone make this argument, but it's interesting you think about the timing of OPEC, the Organization of Petroleum Exporting Countries. Now, they opted to, to, to close the spigot, to reduce oil, to help their profits. And they argue, they claimed that the reason behind that was because the recession's coming and they want to max out their profits before, before the bad times hit. But if note, it was OPEC plus one that made the decision. OPEC plus one, the one is Russia. And so, not to be skeptical or paranoid, but it seemed like if you wanted to, if, if, Saudi Arabia wants to help out Russia, and they're, they're friendly. You increase inflation more in this country via oil. That's going to affect our elections here. And they recognize that the Republicans are, are much less committed to Ukraine than, than the Democrats are, Democrats are, generally speaking. 
um, that might be part of foreign policy. They're being impacted, being how foreign countries trying to impact our, our, our internal dynamics by, by manipulation, commodities, and what have you. What do you guys think about that? Is that, is that a nutty conspiracy theory, a tin hat, tin, tin hat time, or is it, is it more of a kind of based in some type of reality? What no, do you think? I, no I, I think it's, it's definitely based in reality that, uh, you know, you you would want to help out a friend, if you will. If you're friendly with a country, well, you want to, want to try to help them. Lots of evidence for that in a whole variety of cases. So, no, I don't think it's conspiratorial or, or, or crazy or, or any of those things. I, I don't know. I, I didn't read the same article, so I don't I don't have this this the same degree of trust in it that you do. But <laughs> but it, it it seems plausible to me. Doesn't seem you know, out of left field. It I don't know if it's true or not, but it it's plausible. I don't know what Andrew thinks. Mind you, the war is taking place in Europe. However, United States is providing the lion's share of assistance to Ukraine. This is what is at stake. Are Europeans willing to step up, to beef up their commitment to well, Ukraine? Poland might after a couple of missiles landed in their country today, Andrew. Yeah, well, Poland maybe not does not have. The resources, we're talking about resources now. Right. Are Europeans willing to beef up their commitment to Ukraine? Or are Europeans supporting Ukraine because of the United States involvement? And what about if United States seizes or cuts down on commitment? Are they ready to step in? Question. It's a good, very good question. Yeah, that's lots of reasons for foreign entities to want to have some influence on our elections, mm -hmm. uh, no matter what side you're on. Right. Is this something that's been going on for a very long time? It's got to be a function of, of the Internet from the 1990s on where, you know, you have the troll farms in, in Russia um, just putting out disinformation. I mean, that's just a function of modern communication technology now. Before the 1990s, I think that was not even, even imagined because I don't know how you could operationalize it. Because this is another issue, the issue of election misinformation and disinformation. There is a lot out there, and the team highlighted that in its report. How are we going to deal with these issues? There are lots of issues here that we need to really pay attention to in the name of democracy, as the president said. Democracy was on the ballot. And democracy is about dealing with these issues. It's even deeper than that because you don't just have foreign manipulation, but I mean the the internet has these algorithms that essentially you know, feed an addiction. They, they they give you the information that you want to hear, that you want to see. Um and the more um the more kind of violent the content, the, the the greater the reaction. It gets back to that negative affect that that Steve was talking about. And so, I mean, we we don't even we don't need to just fear. Although I think Andrew is absolutely right. The the, the foreign misinformation, but the, the misinformation from within our own shores, the the the, the for profit activity to feed people uh, what they want to hear, whether it's true or not. Um, just just to feed a belief system. And so, I mean, I think we increasingly are having a problem between objective and subjective reality, that objective reality is becoming far less important and subjective reality is kind of taking over. And so then the perceptions become become real, at least in the mind of the voter. And I, I find that a, a real threat to democracy that's very, very scary. And along those very lines, it's remarkable. You see the studies that, that focus on that see directly how someone has, a, has an adamant point of view about something. They're given direct evidence that contradicts it. That's empirical evidence. That's pretty persuasive. It reinforces their original belief that the actual, when you give them contradictory evidence to, to, to inform them that you may be wrong in your, your perspective, their perspective gets reinforced. How does one deal with that? And I mean, that, that undermines democratic theory, you know? But a quick question I wanted to ask you guys, and 
it's really intriguing here, the dynamic with Joe Biden. This is this is a vindication for Joe Biden to some extent. They lose the House, but, you know, structural variables, that's to be expected. But, you know, it, they maintain the Senate. The big question, you know, the $64,000 question for the Democratic Party, should Joe Biden be their nominee in the upcoming election? What do you guys think? It's a tough question. I mean, a lot of ways of looking at it, but what do you think? I don't think you can ask it in a vacuum. I think you have to ask, what are the alternatives? So I asked that question to my students, right, just to get the reaction from obviously a different generation than mine. I mm -hmm. mean, these a lot of these kids are young enough to be my grandkids. But it was interesting that in probably my most politically savvy class, my comparative politics class over at Merced College, the overwhelming response was Gavin Newsom should run. And I was surprised by that. And they said, he's young, he's a younger generation, he's fresh. And they primarily said, he looks good <laughs> and he sounds good. And my two best students said, ideas and policies have become so less important than image that they should run him for the image factor, regardless of his policies, because policies don't matter very much anymore. I, f I found that a really interesting that is, response from that, my students. that is fascinating. That yeah. is really fascinating. Yeah. And I, I was kind of in the front of the room stunned, like, and the rest of my students, they were all nodding their heads. Yes. And I was, it's kind of reinforcing what you just said a few minutes ago. So when you, when, when you made the comment you just made, I thought, my God, my students kind of came to this conclusion. Um, you know, a lot of young people voted, younger people during the 2022 elections. And more we qualify to vote in 2024. And whether they will go out to vote in 2024, we depend a lot on who is the candidate. They want a candidate that they can associate with. They want a candidate that they think is like them, who does not appear to be waiting, you know, for the final pronouncement to be made, etc. And so, in response to what you are saying, the younger people who we deal with on a daily basis do not want Biden. Who's the uh, alternative? There are many out there, but they would prefer to step up. I, I just want to say, it's interesting to think about that, our richest students and, 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 and Andrew's comments about it, but let's think about you got to think about the Electoral College. Can you win Arizona? Can you win Nevada? Can you win Georgia? Can Gavin Newsom win those? I don't I, think not, so. No, I don't think so either. That, but it's funny. That's one thing in my class as well. I, I love all my students incredibly, platonically, of course. Um, but I, I get a sense from then there's a bit of ageism. Biden's too old. Mm -hmm. you know? And he's got a speech impediment. He stutters. Mm -hmm. I have a stutter too, and I'm, I'm sympathetic to him indeed. <laughs> but he's got, but he, he looks older, but clearly you look at his year's experience and his, his getting a number of things passed through a one vote margin in the U.S. Senate. And just, you know, you know, a flip of five seats, you know, five Democrats opposing what he wants in the House, it doesn't get through the House either. Incredibly successful. I agree. Yet he doesn't seem to get credit for it because he's not, I mean, Gavin Newsom's a handsome young guy, beautiful wife, charismatic, never misspeaks, you know, he's quaffed, you know, he's, he's good to go. But I think but maybe, again, maybe a generational thing, but it seems like, you know, Biden doesn't seem to get credit because of the age. He's always well, too old, but like. But Steve, on the other side, Trump doesn't get that criticism. He's the same age as Biden. But there's a perception yeah. by a lot of people mm -hmm. that that he's younger and he's not. Well, you know, exactly. Well, yeah, Biden's almost is 80 and Trump's are 75. But Trump, I mean, Trump is yeah, he's, one thing that helps Trump is he's got that energy. He's got that vigor about it. Remember Kennedy, the vigor aspect of it. He's got that energy when he speaks. And when Biden speaks, I think he's, he's, he's constrained by a stutter at times, definitely. But he's just got an older voice, you know? And Trump has just got, he's, he's got younger quality about him. But obviously, you look, you compare them. Biden looks so much more fit, so much more healthy. Yet, yet Trump has got that that got that that that, that, that coloration of a more vibrant younger guy, but you're right though they're, they're the same He's age. Not. Yeah, the same age. But I mean, but but again, it, it gets to the question like of ageism. I mean, we rail against sexism and racism, but what about ageism? There seems to be that that element. But yeah. Steve, remember just recently, 
who was the darling of the young kids? Bernie Sanders. That's true. Who's the oldest guy out there? And yet, you know, I went to a Sanders rally and I felt like I was at a Boy Scout and Girl Scout convention. These oh. kids, the, the kids, I mean, I, I felt out of place. I was, I was the, you know, Bernie and I were the old guys <laughs> yeah, in, the, in, in, in the room. <laughs> uh, and so it was strange because, you know, if there is ageism, it's kind of selective. No, but exactly. But his oratory, you can, Bernie Sanders gave him a speech. He sounds like a really younger guy. He's got he plenty of energy and he's got a force and force and, and, and verve to him. Biden has just got. You know, he looks very fit, but he's got that that softer voice. He's getting older, and he, you know, he just he's got that look about him. And then he, and then he gets caught stuttering sometimes, and people people interpret that and that he's cognitively impaired or something, or he's an old guy. But he's always had a stutter. He's always got a little 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 caught sometimes. But that's a great point about Bernie Sanders. About you know <laughs> th these are not young men, but both both Trump and Sanders have got that real that that energy and verve, which yeah. one equates with with youth. So again, it's, it's back to that, you know, perception as opposed to reality. Yeah. Right? I mean, some of they're perceived as not old, even though they are. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's, that's a good point. Yeah. Interesting. You brought up Gavin Newsom. I, I'm as curious about the strategy of, of putting forth candidates. When I think of Gavin Newsom as a potential replacement for, for Biden, I can't help but think about the feeding frenzy that the Republicans would have with a Gavin Newsom. How much of that goes into picking a candidate, not just someone you want, but someone that maybe the opposition, maybe it can be a little more palatable? I, I think one of the prime examples of that, 2004, John Kerry up against John Edwards. John, I mean, the Democrats voted and they voted in force in the primaries for Kerry, knowing he was electable. John Edwards, a very a younger, handsome guy, you know, energetic and, and resonating with younger people. But I think there's there there, there's a Machiavellian, you know, calculation. There is like you got to pick someone not just you like, but who can win the damn election and who can win the electoral college. I said who can who can win those 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 states those battleground states that are in play. Gavin knew that, yeah, as you said, Frankie. Gavin Newsom right. winning those states. I just, I mean, you look at homelessness and just the Im Im immigration policy, sanctuary city policies. I mean, they're they're just gonna they're gonna you know metaphorically tar and feather them. Well, and part of the problem. You know, and I guess both parties have this, but especially going into this next election, I mean, there's really two elections. There's there's the, the nomination phase where you're trying to get the nomination of your party. And then there's the general election where you're trying to win over especially the independents, but also mobilize your base. And, you know, what what it takes to, to win your party's nomination is very different than what it takes mm -hmm. to win a general election. And so. I mean, obviously, the prerequisite to, is getting to the general election, but but sometimes candidates have gotten themselves in real trouble because of where they've placed themselves during the nomination, and they've never been able to recover. So, I mean, that's that that's a, that's a tough one, right? Because uh, you you tend to run more liberal uh, if you're a Democrat, or more Repu uh, more conservative if you're Republican in in the nomination phase, and then suddenly you're trying to pivot to the center. And some people are a lot more adept at that. And again, that goes back to that, that charisma and personality and some of the other factors, uh, you know, have those or not. Yeah, there, there was a long time theory in political science about trying to explain why were Republicans keep winning the White House, but Democrats weren't, but Democrats were still controlling the Congress. What explained that? And the theory was that Democrats had two rough and tumble primaries. They had too many people running. They, they really went at each other. And so basically to win the primaries, you had to navigate far left and then you couldn't as rich was talking about you couldn't race back to the center quickly enough to to win to win the general election that that was that was that working theory then but also because that the question then about bernie sanders could sanders you know could sanders have beaten trump in 2016 could he beat him in 2020 i, I just I, I you know so. i don't think so either it just seemed like you know you got to work where the, where the country falls in terms of the ideological spectrum so i think this is a great opportunity to circle back to what andrew said earlier people voted in the midterms with the 2024 election in mind, you're talking about potentially replacing Biden with somebody. Do you think that can happen on the other side? You mentioned this might be a rebuke of Trump. Can you see somebody else stepping in? And just off the top of my head, obviously DeSantis comes to mind. You just learned the lesson that you cannot, you cannot call, call Trump out. I, I would have thought January 6th, would, I would have thought any number of things would have ended his political time. You know, when in the primaries, then, then January 6th, you know, Andrew? Well, again, Florida is not the United States. A lot of people are talking about Florida, Florida. But if he wins big in Florida, that doesn't mean that he will win 
big in other states. It does not imply that he is already the anointed person for the Republicans. Either way, if the governor here wins big, it doesn't mean that he will become the nominee if ever Biden decides not to run. But mind you, 2024 is going to be rather different in many ways. In the first place, the younger voters are looking for someone from either side that is young. Now, the majority of this podcast, we've been talking about the surprise that the red wave was more of like a red ripple. On the flip side of that, were there any races that people thought would go Democrats but went Republicans? That, that was a surprise for the other side? I'm surprised. I mean, Adam Gray in, 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 in District, District 13, you know, it's, it looks like a close race now. They haven't counted all the votes, but I would have thought that would have been— I mean, you look at the voter registration he has in, in District 13 that encompasses Turlock and our area here. You compare that to Josh Harder's um, District 9 that, that encompasses Stockton. They look almost exactly the same. The registration rates in terms of Republican, Democrat, uh, no, no party preference either. Um, yet Gray's kind of struggling there. He may, may pull it out. It just depends as, as the votes get counted. But that, that, that kind of surprised me. I really thought that would have been. But this is the Central Valley. If you're going to elect Republicans, this is where you're going to see them. And so, but, it, but I think maybe it helped harder out Stockton's metropolitan area. Over here, Tur Turlock, it, you know, it's more suburban and, 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 and agrarian. But that, that, that's kind of surprised me so far. Gerrymandering, right? Yeah. And partly the fact that California lost a congressional seat. So, I mean, some of the redistricting was because you had to develop 52 seats instead of 53. So part of it's the usual gerrymandering. Part of it is something that we've never seen in California history. We, we lost a representative for the first time ever. Yep. So that, you know, again, the started teaching a long time ago. The assumption was is that, you know, Western and Southern states were going to continue to grow, grow, grow. And, you know, the first decade that uh, I taught political science, when the 1990 census came along, California picked up seven seats uh, in the 1990 census. And we right. just thought it was going to continue to happen. And, yeah. and now population growth in California is essentially stagnant. It's essentially still. And so, you know, then obviously, where are people moving in California? Well, a lot of people moved into the valley from the coastal area because it became so expensive. So, you know, even just because the population is stagnant in your state doesn't mean that the distribution of people within the state stays the same. And I used to always make an assumption that Orange County was, uh, you know, red and you know, it made me think of old Bob Dornan. And you know, <laughs> then Orange County flipped and elected some Democrats. And so sometimes our mental images, um, you know, are, are true, but it's of a, of a bygone era. And so, you know, California is you know, shifting in some areas. Yeah, that's true. You are raising a lot of questions that do require follow-ups. For example, the issue of the next candidates for presidency. We at the table here are all old folks. <laughs> belong to that group. Thanks for the reminder, Andrew. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry. Well, I okay. didn't exclude myself, <laughs> my brother. And that's why it might be expedient if you were to take it further and talk to the younger chaps in terms of what would be their preference. Who would they go out to easily vote for and why? as he did in his class. I mean, if I'm Donald Trump, I, I want the the water very muddy. I, I, I don't want to just be me and DeSantis. I, I, I want Pence in there. I want Haley in there. I want as many people involved in this and just turn it into a, a dogfight. And the reason is, is because if I'm Donald Trump, I'm thinking I've got a core group of followers I'm not going to lose. And if I can divide my opponents up, and they cannibalize one another, by the time the smoke clears, I will have locked up enough delegates 
to get the nomination because the Republicans have a very different form of electoral process than the Democrats. They have a lot of winner take alls. And if there's a lot of candidates and the opponents to Trump are splitting that vote up, Trump's going to get that nomination easily. If the debt clears very early and it's, I mean, I'm just using this because this is the name in the news right now. But if it's one-on-one, Trump versus DeSantis, well, now it becomes a lot edgier for Donald Trump. So, you know, if I'm advising Trump, and I never would, because definitely the complete opposite of it. But looking at it through through his lens, muddy and confused is probably the best world for him. I don't know how you guys feel. I, I say Rich nailed, nailed it on the head there. I mean, that, that was the 2016 dynamic. That's what de- helped, helped out. Trump win, beat all those establishment Republicans because there were so damn many of them, 16, 17 of them. And, you know, basically, if it had just been him against Jeb Bush, he's going after Jeb Bush, he's tired, he's an old man, what have you, it would have been a very different dynamic. Trump was able to profit immeasurably by having so many other Republicans divide the establishment, establish Republican vote. You know, and I think, you know, DeSantis goes up against him, as Rich says, that that, 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 that dynamic does, does not favor Trump, I don't think. But if you get Haley and Pence and a whole bunch of people, Tim Scott, and I mean, mm-hmm. the, the whole bunch of people, if they all do the same thing they did last time, I think Trump's going to exactly. is gonna win again for the same reason that you're talking about. Exactly. And that, that's very much a function of, of the Republican Party's uh, rule, rules in the primaries. I, obviously, they didn't change it because Trump became president, but you would have thought in normal time for Trump to take over that party and just take it, take it over completely. The Republican National Committee would have changed the rules of picking the delegates to vote for people. Uh, that, that would have they, that, did. that, that would have, they didn't do it at all. The Democrats changed theirs in the '60s after they had some bad bad electoral losses. But you're going to do it after a loss. Once the presidency, once the person who won the won the process wins and is, is, is sitting there in the White House, he's he's titular head of the party. They're not going to go up against him. But the Republican National Committee really has got to think about reviewing reviewing their their, their rules there, their processes. You're right. The Democrats did that with McGovern Fraser. And, exactly. Yeah. As we near the end of the podcast, any final thoughts about how everything turned out? Well, you know, I think I said it at the start. I was, you know, I'm not going going to claim brilliance here. I I did not expect this at all. I I thought it would be a better night uh, for the Republicans than it turned out to be. Um, I mean, one of the I mean, I had a couple of odd thoughts that, that I haven't explored, but I mean, one of them um, that I thought of, and I've, I've seen no articles, I've heard nothing, but one of the things that that I thought was, you know, to what extent did COVID affect the electorate? I mean, uh, older voters tend to be a lot more conservative. Uh, COVID killed a lot more older people. And, and did the pandemic uh, play a role in some of these very, very close elections? I have no evidence for it. But I don't know, you know, I, I found out during COVID that I lost a couple of my high school friends and they were both very conservative Republicans back in Kentucky. Uh, and I'm wondering how many more, you know, people like that died during this horrible uh, pandemic. And I mean, I don't have any evidence for it, but I mean, believe it or not, that was one of the, the odd thoughts I had during the night was, you know, did the electorate change? It's obviously not much even a million people is one third of a percent of the population so i mean we're not talking about you know bonic plague or something that that just absolutely devastated the society but given how close the elections were in some places could it have made a slight effect in some places so that was kind of my oddball thought of the night i don't know why i thought that Mm. it's kind of morbid and, and 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 strange in some ways but uh you know i i i think that uh Steve hit it on the head earlier. I mean, I think if you're the Republicans, you you, you stress the the House and you stress maybe an alternative to Trump. Um, but I still think it was a good night for the Democrats. That's my takeaway. I was shocked. I did not think it would be that good a night for them. I would just my, my concluding remarks would be: I agree, it is a good night for the for the Democrats for sure. Uh, but what amazes me is how close these races are. These aren't like 52 to 48, which are pretty close. These were 50.2 over over 49 uh, over 49.8. I mean, it's just remarkable. They're they're so damn close. And so, uh, to leave this conversation, my my point here is just to kind of think about 
what direction should the parties go? What do the Democrats learn from this? You know, the culture war stuff, you know, the immigration stuff, the wokeism stuff. How do they, is that hurting them or helping them? And the Republicans, what do they take from it? Do they, you know, the, as we talked about our last discussion, we, our, our, our last discussion in here was about uh, Republican parties become a personality cult around Trump. How sustainable is that? Maybe it's not sustainable anymore, but like they think about what, what's that party about? You know, what policies do they push? And, and you know, and to get back to their old roots. My father was a lifelong Republican. He's long dead, but I'd love to talk to him. Love to see, see him anyways, my pop. But just ask him, what do you make of the party now? And what, what, would you, what would you do about this? You know, it's just a fascinating question about what direction do the parties go now to maintain? Because these, they're so close, these elections. I mean, control the Senate? Oh, my God. You know, and the, the, the control the House? Is the country liberal or is it conservative? What the hell are we? And are we polarized? I mean, my last comment here, I'll, I'll turn over, over to Andrew, is that it's really, you know, a 50-50 split in a lot of ways between Democrats and Republicans. Does that mean we're incredibly polarized or not? I mean, it, the, by the nature of our electoral system, we can only pick one of two parties to vote for, really. So it, it's, it's binary. It's one or the other. So just because it's 50-50 or 51-49, does that mean we're really at odds with each other or not? You got to pick one of the parties to go with. Does that mean we're really separated? You, you don't see that with polling with abortion. Probably the majority of Americans are, are, are for, for abortion rights. So anyway, so it's where we head from here. It's my eyes are wide open as a political scientist and as a citizen. It's a fascinating time. Andrew? Well, I approach this from the point of view that there is... There are no fights in the open, but I would like us to pay attention and to discuss more the state of affairs of the country in terms of, A, the numerous election laws that have been enacted in the various states and their impact on the fundamental rights of Americans. Do these laws already enacted violate fundamental human rights of the people of this country or the states in which they are? That's one concern that I think we should look at. We should also look at how polarized this society has become. And thirdly, maybe we cannot be able to change things the gerrymandering is a major problem. It is not the people now that vote for their representatives. It's the representatives that choose who should vote for them. That's a perversion of democracy. As expected, there was plenty to talk about on this episode. Thank you all for rejoining me for this discussion. And any current or prospective students out there, if this discussion piqued your interest, check out your course catalog. Take a poli sci class with any one of these three professors. And if you're not a student, you can listen back to this podcast and you can also check out the other podcast we recorded about the January 6th Capitol attack. You can find that episode and all other episodes of the Stan State Educast, as well as episodes of our Taking Care of You podcast at csustan.edu slash podcast. And of course, you can find us on your favorite podcasting platform. So please follow and subscribe so you can get updates when we upload new episodes. Once again, I'm your host, Frankie Tovar. Thank you for listening to the Stan State Educast.